Chapter 5 Of course she must buy the tea in Uncle Benjamin's grocery store. To buy it anywhere else was unthinkable. Yet Valency hated to go to Uncle Benjamin's store on her twenty-ninth birthday. There was no hope that he would not remember it. Why, demanded Uncle Benjamin, leeringly, as he tied up her tea, are young ladies like bad grammarians? Valency, with Uncle Benjamin's will in the background of her mind, said meekly, I don't know. Why? Because, chuckled Uncle Benjamin, they can't decline matrimony. The two clerks, Joe Hammond and Claude Bertram, chuckled also, and Valency disliked them a little more than ever. On the first day Claude Bertram had seen her in the store she had heard him whisper to Joe, Who is that? And Joe had said, Valency Sterling, one of the Deerwood old maids. Curable or incurable? Claude had asked with a snicker, evidently thinking the question very clever. Valency smarted anew with the sting of that old recollection. Twenty-nine, Uncle Benjamin was saying. Dear me, Doss, you're dangerously near the second corner and not even thinking of getting married yet. Twenty-nine. It seems impossible. Then Uncle Benjamin said an original thing. Uncle Benjamin said, How time does fly. I think it crawls, said Valency passionately. Passion was so alien to Uncle Benjamin's conception of Valency that he didn't know what to make of her. To cover his confusion, he asked another conundrum as he tied up her beans. Cousin Stickles had remembered at the last moment that they must have beans. Beans were cheap and filling. What two ages are apt to prove illusory? asked Uncle Benjamin, and, not waiting for Valency to give it up, he added, marriage and marriage. A marriage is pronounced maraz, said Valency shortly, picking up her tea and her beans. For the moment she did not care whether Uncle Benjamin cut her out of his will or not. She walked out of the store while Uncle Benjamin stared after her with his mouth open. Then he shook his head. Poor Doss is taking it hard, he said. Valency was sorry by the time she reached the next crossing. Why had she lost her patience like that? Uncle Benjamin would be annoyed and would likely tell her mother that Doss had been impertinent to me. And her mother would lecture her for a week. I've held my tongue for twenty years, thought Valency. Why couldn't I have held it once more? Yes, it was just twenty, Valency reflected, since she had first been twit with her loverless condition. She remembered the bitter moment perfectly. She was just nine years old, and she was standing alone on the school playground while the other little girls of her class were playing a game in which you must be chosen by a boy as his partner before you could play. Nobody had chosen Valency, little, pale, black-haired Valency, with her prim, long-sleeved apron and odd, slanted eyes. Oh, said a pretty little girl to her, I'm so sorry for you. You haven't got a bow. Valency had said defiantly, as she continued to say for twenty years, I don't want a bow. But this afternoon Valency once and for all stopped saying that. I'm going to be honest with myself anyhow, she thought savagely. Uncle Benjamin's riddles hurt me because they are true. I do want to be married. I want a house of my own, I want a husband of my own, I want sweet, little fat babies of my own, Valency stopped suddenly aghast at her own recklessness. She felt sure that Reverend Dr. Stalling, who passed her at this moment, read her thoughts and disapproved of them thoroughly. Valency was afraid of Dr. Stalling, had been afraid of him ever since the Sunday, twenty-three years before, when he had first come to St. Albans. Valency had been too late for Sunday school that day, and she had gone into the church timidly and sat in their pew. No one else was in the church, nobody except the new rector, Dr. Stalling. Dr. Stalling stood up in front of the choir door, beckoned to her, and said sternly, Little boy, come up here. Valency had stared around her. There was no little boy, there was no one in all the huge church but herself. This strange man with the blue glasses couldn't mean her. She was not a boy. Little boy, repeated Dr. Stalling, more sternly still, shaking his forefinger fiercely at her, come up here at once. 
Valencia rose as if hypnotized and walked up the aisle. She was too terrified to do anything else. What dreadful thing was going to happen to her? What had happened to her? Had she actually turned into a boy? She came to a stop in front of Dr. Stalling. Dr. Stalling shook his forefinger, such a long, knuckly forefinger, at her and said, Little boy, take off your hat. Valency took off her hat. She had a scrawny little pigtail hanging down her back, but Dr. Stalling was short-sighted and did not perceive it. Little boy, go back to your seat and always take off your hat in church. Remember! Valency went back to her seat, carrying her hat like an automaton. Presently, her mother came in. Das, said Mrs. Sterling, what do you mean by taking off your hat? Put it on instantly. Valency put it on instantly. She was cold with fear lest Dr. Stalling should immediately summon her up front again. She would have to go, of course, it never occurred to her that one could disobey the rector, and the church was full of people now. Oh, what would she do if that horrible, stabbing forefinger were shaken at her again before all those people? Valency sat through the whole service in an agony of dread and was sick for a week afterwards. Nobody knew why Mrs. Frederick again bemoaned herself of her delicate child. Dr. Stalling found out his mistake and laughed over it to Valency, who did not laugh. She never got over her dread of Dr. Stalling. And now to be caught by him on the street corner, thinking such things. Valency got her John Foster book, Magic of Wings. His latest, All About Birds, said Miss Clarkson. She had almost decided that she would go home, instead of going to see Dr. Trent. Her courage had failed her. She was afraid of offending Uncle James, afraid of angering her mother, afraid of facing gruff, shaggy-browed old Dr. Trent, who would probably tell her, as he had told Cousin Gladys, that her trouble was entirely imaginary and that she only had it because she liked to have it. No, she would not go, she would get a bottle of Red Fern's purple pills instead. Redfern's purple pills were the standard medicine of the Sterling clan. Had they not cured second cousin Geraldine when five doctors had given her up? Valency always felt very skeptical concerning the virtues of the purple pills, but there might be something in them, and it was easier to take them than to face Dr. Trent alone. She would glance over the magazines in the reading room a few minutes and then go home. Valency tried to read a story, but it made her furious. On every page was a picture of the heroine surrounded by adoring men. And here was she, Valancy Sterling, who could not get a solitary bow. Valancy slammed the magazine shut, she opened Magic of Wings. Her eyes fell on the paragraph that changed her life. Fear is the original sin, wrote John Foster. Almost all the evil in the world has its origin in the fact that someone is afraid of something. It is a cold, slimy serpent coiling about you. It is horrible to live with fear, and it is of all things degrading. Valency shut magic of wings and stood up. She would go and see Dr. Trent.